Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel for my next video concerning um, the Great War at Sea series game Jutland. And in this video I'm going to be looking at the basic combat system uh, as it applies to this game. So there's two combat systems. For those wanting a more involved um, a bit of tactical naval combat you can use the advanced rules and I'll be showing those in the next video. But for those who prefer a simpler and often faster combat resolution, this is the basic rules. Um, so what I'm going to do is I've set up a very small scenario, which is my adaptation of one of the 1905 scenarios. And this represents a hypothetical conflict between Germany and Sweden in about 1905. So... We've got our opposing forces lined up, and this does make for a fairly interesting confrontation because the the huge and terrifying high seas fleet of World War I didn't really exist at this point. Uh, and in, a, in some important senses, the Swedish Navy was actually a bit more formidable than the German one. How much would change in less than a decade? Um, but before we get into that, I'm just going to apologize profusely for the... <laughs> really uh, um, terrible video I put up previously. Um, in my defense, it was late and I'm a bit of a muppet when it comes to technology anyway. And I did not realize when I uploaded it that the image had been reversed. So I'm really, really sorry about that, guys. I did think of deleting and redoing it, but so many of you had already put up such awesome comments. I thought, okay, I'll just leave it. I was just generally waving components around, so I'll, I'll, I'll swallow the embarrassment and join you all in having a good laugh at my expense. Um, so let's get on with this um, demonstration with everything the right way round this time. Yay! <laughs> so just to go over the anatomy of a ship counter, you've obviously got your gorgeous graphic that shows off the ship in, in beautiful detail. I'd commented on the artwork in the last video. Um, you've got your national ensign, so Sweden, Germany, type of vessel and its designation. This number here is the ship's speed. Um, if it's in a circle, it denotes a slower speed. If it's in a, a square um, graphic, it denotes a ship that's slightly faster. Um, these three numbers here are from left to right, primary gun battery, secondary gun battery, tertiary gun battery. So primaries are big things, roughly, you know, 9.2, 9.4 or 10 inch and bigger. Um, secondaries are roughly 8 inch down to, say, 6 inch. And tertiaries at their biggest are about 4 inch, 4.5s, 4.7s and smaller. So you can immediately see the German ships have an advantage with a small number of very large caliber guns and an and a equally small number of very light caliber, really anti-torpedo boat guns. The Swedish warships have a slightly more balanced armament, medium weapons, but nothing excessively huge, nothing excessively tiny. Um, these little circles in the bottom right-hand corners are um, torpedoes. So a circle indicates that you have a hull-mounted torpedo, so torpedo tube, I should say, so not very accurate. Uh, and then, of course, we have the names of the two ships. So in basic combat, whether it's a battle scenario or a strategic situation in which two fleets have sailed into contact with each other, unless, unless there's special rules to the contrary, you always start at long range. And what I tend to do is just move the counters apart to denote this. So I will just send the, the Beowulf and the Siegfried over there. And the Gutter and the Thule can stay down here. Tell you what, just to be neat, because I think in the scenario the Siegfried was the flagship, I'll move them round. The graphics always have the ship heading that way. <laughs> so, the first thing that happens in, in combat is you start at long range. Um, you, can go, you go straight into the firing round. So, in basic combat, you open fire on each other. Combat is considered simultaneous. You can declare whether your ships are targeting their opposite numbers or crossing their fire or ganging up on one enemy ship. As long as you declare it before any dice are rolled and you stick to your decision, 
that's fine. So for the purposes of this example, let's just say that the Germans have decided that they're going to target the corresponding ship in the enemy line and they declare this. The Swedes decide they'll do, do it rather differently and the Gotha and the Thule are both going to concentrate fire on the Siegfried. So you get your firing round to begin with. Now at long range, primary and secondary weapons can target each other. And broadly speaking, you need a six to hit, subject to the modifiers shown here. Um, in the basic game, you ignore anything that makes reference to a hex um, or, or substitute it for close range. So at long range, there's going to be no modifiers. You'll note the last modifier said something about italicized ship names. On the vessel data sheets that I'd showed you in the previous video, some ship names are italicized. Now, my camera had some trouble focusing on those, so here's one I made earlier myself. Uh, none of the ships participating in this, series, uh, in this scenario had italicized names, so they just get standard gunnery ratings. There's no elite gunnery crews here today. So I'm just going to resolve the fire of the Germans first. So they have no secondary guns and one primary each. And as they're targeting the corresponding ship, let's see what happens when the Siegfried fires. Ooh, terrible. Big splashes far away from the Thule, but otherwise nothing. The Beowulf is going to follow her sister and open fire on the Gotha. And what has she got? Ah, where's that ice gun? Slightly better gunnery, but nothing to write home about. And now it passes over to the Swedes, and the Thule and the Gotha are both going to target the Siegfried. So Thule opens fire first, flagship's prerogative. Oh, nice. One volley missed, but the Swedes have managed to land a fairly solid hit on the Siegfried. Um, I'll just see whether the Gotha similarly hits before I go on to assigning damage. Oh, very nice, tightly bunched salvo there. In fact, I'm even going to put that on either side of the Siegfried for, for visual effect, but she doesn't land a hit at this range. So there's a single hit there from the Thule. So having scored a hit, the Thule now has to consult the gunnery damage table. So she now rolls two dice again and sums them so we get a six that's a hit on a secondary mount now as we can see from her record sheet the Siegfried does not actually have a secondary armament so what happens in this game is there's a rule called referred pain where if you don't have anything in the targeted area it moves down to the next bit so the hit is absorbed on the tertiary gun mount. Now, that is secondary armour. There's three grades of armour. If it's a blank square, there's light or no armour. If it's dashed like this, it's medium armour. And if it's a solid square, then it's heavy armour. So unluckily for poor old Siegfried, um, the armour protecting her tertiary guns is not enough to keep out the Swedish shell. And I will just mark it off as hit. Now what that means for the Germans is if the Siegfried closes to, to close range in a subsequent turn her tertiary guns will now be unavailable. All damage is simultaneous but as this, um, this round of firing is taking place at long range um, the tertiaries never really had a look in anyway. The same goes with torpedoes. They can only be launched at long range, uh, sorry, at short range rather. So that's the round of gunfire over. And the two sides now need to, dis to decide for them uh, uh, whether they wish to close uh, or whether they wish to maintain the engagement at long range. Now, seeing as the Swedes have scored first blood, um, one would think that they would want to um, perhaps close the range and capitalize on their advantage. But as I'm, 
as I'm sort of nominally playing the Swedes, I think I might not do that. I'm not going to be too reliant on my torpedoes because they're very inaccurate weapons, especially as they're hull mounted. And my secondary guns can comfortably hit the Germans from this range anyway. The German players, similarly, I just rolled to see what uh, what action they would take with a slight modifier for their, their tactical outlook and the fact they've already been hit. They're going to try and retain their advantage as well. I mean, they do have their tertiary guns, but most of the Swedish ships are... Pro no, in fact, actually both, because they're sister ships. What am I talking about? Both Swedish ships are protected by the sort of armour that tertiary guns cannot penetrate. So getting into close range, unless the Germans wanted to launch torpedoes, would be a bit of a non-starter for them. So for this turn, both sides want to maintain the current range. Had they wanted to close, had they both wanted to close, that would happen automatically. If one side wishes to close and the other doesn't, you then compare the speed of the two fleets. Now, you cannot separate your fleets out in the basic game, so you are always at the mercy of the slowest ship in your force. Now, everyone's moving at the same speed, so it would have been a draw. If you are tied for speed, you roll off, and whoever gets the higher total gets to decide. So we now enter the second turn of combat. Both sides are going to retain the targeting priorities they had at the beginning. So the Siegfried is going to roll to hit the Thule, and she misses. The Beowulf is going to do likewise and misses the Gotha. Thule is going to return fire. At, oops. Oh my goodness, she's on the ball today. She has hit the Siegfried again. Let's see if the Gotha can match that. No, still no luck for the other ship, but the Swedes have scored another solid hit. So let us bring back the gunnery table and see what horrible things they've done to the Germans this time. Ooh, and they got a three. And that is torpedo mount. Okay. Now, because the Siegfried's torpedo mount, as we can see from this, uh, from the graphic there, is hull mounted... It relies on the armour protection of the hull, which is medium armour. But as the Swedish guns are quite capable of penetrating medium armour, that goes straight through and knocks out the Siegfried's torpedo tubes. It's not looking good for the Germans. Um, now, I wonder, should, should we look at closing... The Germans are a bit reluctant to close. They they want to keep us out of reach, especially as we've been pairing off their tertiary armament and now their torpedoes. But I'm actually beginning to get a bit more confident. I've been hitting the Germans consistently and I want to move forward. So we have a tie. So blue dice for Swedes, red for Germans. Let's see who gets to make the call. Ah, not my day. The Germans managed to maintain the range at long. So we now enter round three. Targeting priorities will remain unchanged, so Siegfried will fire at Thule. Nope. Beowulf will fire at Gotha. Nope. Thule is going to turn her guns on Siegfried. Well, they were already turned on. Oh my goodness! Would you believe it? The Thule is really on the ball today. What about the Gotha? Sorry, I keep rolling these off camera. It's really annoying. No, Gotha is still lagging behind her sister. But to be perfectly honest, she doesn't really need to do anything. Uh, at the rate that the Thule is taking poor Siegfried apart, the Gotha's crew may as well just, you know, break out the popcorn and see how this one goes down. So, gunnery damage, a seven. And that's a hit on the primaries. OK, this is really bad news for the Siegfried now, because although her hull and engines are intact, the highly, highly accurate Swedish fire has completely deprived her of her offensive capacity. Now, this is really bad. Um, 
I mean, at this point, you can go on about honour of the flag and all that, but I would say the Siegfried can legitimately withdraw at this point. Uh, and I think the sensible thing now would be for the Germans to try and withdraw. So withdrawing your fleet and taking them out of the fight in the basic game works pretty much like manoeuvring does anyway, except that you have to be at long range and you have to declare that you're breaking off. Again, if you have the same speed and your opponent wishes to follow you, you have to, uh, you have to roll off for it to see whether you can get away from them. Uh, now, in keeping with the way the Swedes planned the defence of their coastline in this era, I am actually inclined to let the Germans go. We have made our point. I'm assuming in this scenario that it's a German incursion into Swedish waters. So there's been a bit of a spat resulting from a diplomatic disagreement. The Germans have turned up full of fight, been given a thorough drubbing, and now they're turning away. We're holding our borders, and that's all we need to do. Honour is satisfied. The flag is satisfied. It is 1905, after all. Um, and to take the advice of the British Admiral Beatty, who admittedly wouldn't say these words for another 15 years or so, um, when you're winning, risk nothing. So the Germans will turn away. I will not interfere. And that is the end of the action. So there we go. Well done, Sweden. Um, I hope that's given you a good idea of how um, basic combat works in the Great War at Sea series. It's quite simplistic, but I personally like these rules because when you're playing large um, strategic scenarios that <clears throat> can result in actions of up to 20 ships aside or even more sometimes, a combat system that resolves uh, uh, very quickly with quite realistic narrative damage, um, uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, a system that generates realistic narratives of damage um, is actually quite a valuable thing to have. It does keep the game moving. Um, and of course, if you want something tactically meatier, there is also the advanced system, which I will be looking at in the next video. But for now, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to you guys for following this series. My apologies again for the very, very, very uh, amateurish um, flipped image of the previous video, but um, thank you for bearing with me on that one. Um, to my long-suffering Gronyards and veterans, a huge hello to you guys. Thank you very much for watching, and more importantly, thank you for your company. It's really, really good to have you guys on board. I always welcome the comments. Thank you so much for all the feedback on the first video. And I look forward to hearing from you if, if you have anything to say about this one. Um, if you're new to my channel, or indeed if this is the first of my videos you're watching, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for paying the channel a visit. Um, if it's the Great War at Sea series that brought you here, then I hope you'll carry on following what I'm putting up. And if it's wargaming in general, please have a browse around the rest of the channel. I hope you find something you like. Um, but whoever you are and wherever you're watching from, um, a very warm welcome and my heartfelt thanks for following the series. I really hope to see you guys in the next one. Take care. Bye.